Today we are honored and we are excited to be joined by a dynamic group of young performers from the Rise Center in Richmond, California. They are called Raw Talent, and they'll be rocking our studio today, just as they did when they kicked off the Teachers for Social Justice Conference in San Francisco last October for an audience of about 2,000 people. RISE sponsors a variety of safe and empowering community-based programs for young people that are grounded in social justice. Raw Talent is the music and performing arts program at RISE, and we will learn more about the program and get to enjoy their performances in a moment, but first, let's find out who we have with us today. I'm going to ask you all to go around and tell us who you are and one thing that's important to know about you. My name is Dante Clark, 24-year-old, Richmond native. Uh, I do spoken word poetry. Um, I'm a music artist, uh, and I facilitate spoken word workshops. What's important about me is I, I live and die for the, for the same cause. All right. Thank you for that. I'm DeAndre Evans. I'm a facilitator with Raw Talent and Rise Center, and I am also an actor, a writer, and a rapper. And one thing that's important to know about me is that I care a lot about people. All right, welcome. Thank you for that. My name is Ty John Sykes. I'm 22 years old. I'm a community activist. That's what's important about me. All right, thank you. My name is Molly Rayner, and I coordinate the Raw Talent Music and Performing Arts Program at RISE. Um, an important thing to know about me is that I truly believe that the arts can make social change. All right, thank you, Bella. My name is Micah Marshall. I'm sitting in for Naya Benga, who is a raw talent artist. Um, one thing that's important to know about me is that I want to find spaces to empower young people. All right. Thank you all for coming down. This was a rainy day. Not easy to get here. Thank you for being here today. Let me ask you all to tell us a little more about RISE. What do the letters R-Y-S-E actually stand for? Um, so RISE isn't actually an acronym. When we first started the process of naming RISE, we wanted to create an acronym, but it didn't really settle. Um, so the word RISE kind of represents the movement of social change and community transformation, um, of being able to rise together um, in youth empowerment. All right. And how did the organization get started? So we started working with a group of young folks um, at Richmond High in a group called Youth Together, a youth organizing group. Um, and they were faced with a lot of the trials and tribulations of growing up in Richmond, a lot of violence, a lot of gun violence that resulted in the death of a, their young peers. Um, and so through that process, they decided that they wanted to create a safe space in our county um, for young people to be able to have access to resources and supportive programs and be able to just have a safe space that they can engage in within their community. All right. And when was that when it started? October 18, 2008 was our pilot day. That's when we opened the doors of our center. Um, but we've been working since maybe 2000, 2001 in building this process. All right. And tell us about Raw Talent. How is that connected to RISE? And what does Raw Talent do? Um, so Raw Talent started off as the creative arts program at the Making Waves Education Program in Richmond. And then last year, um, the after-school program of Making Waves closed its doors. And so we shifted over to the RISE Center and we merged with RISE. So we're now their performing arts program. Raw Talent started about seven years ago, totally organically, when my name's Molly again, when I um, had a workshop with Dante when he was a senior in high school, and we just found that we had a shared passion for spoken word poetry. So even though we were in like an academic after school setting, um, we started doing other workshops with youth. And then over the years, more and more youth got involved. We started putting on shows, putting out publications, going on retreats and field trips. And eventually we expanded from just spoken word to theater and started putting on full-fledged plays. Cool. Maybe rather than asking you to say more about what you do, you can share something of what you do with us right now. Sounds good. All right. Tell us what we're going to be hearing. Well, you're going to be hearing um, our presentation that we put on at the Teachers for Social Justice conference in October, and it's a really important conference to us that we've attended pretty much every year. We've taught workshops at um, because Raw Talent and the Rye Center are founded in critical pedagogy and social justice, and so it's really exciting every year to gather with thousands of other educators and youth workers who also um, have a their practices are founded in social justice. So, yeah, we were very honored to be asked to be one of the keynote performers or presenters at this conference, and um, we decided to weave together a series of poems, speeches, skits, 
and just speaking from the heart about how um, social justice based education and culturally culturally relevant curriculum impacts the work that we do and the youth that we serve and why we think it's so important. So we're going to start off with Dante performing a poem on this topic. And if you can visualize as he's performing the poem, when we were on stage, um, I'm standing there as the teacher, as like a white middle class teacher, and the students are starting to file in um, low income youth of color that's supposed to be set in Richmond, let's just say at Richmond High. And they're filing into the classroom and sitting down with their books as Dante performs this poem. All right. As morning dew glaze across cracked bottles and torn plastic and uncultivated soil, and a crammed space rumbles in appetite deep inside Section 8 housing beneath a rusted ceiling where iron tears in a quivering pit bellows off the cliff notes to ya. Here lies a brown boy who awakes to a moldy frost setting into his bones. The third morning this week, he struggled to climb out from his weeping puddle, searched through rubble for water ground to plant his weary feet to pieces of watching his best friend's head explode in front of him. The sight, mind-blowing to say the least, don't you think? With scrawny shoulder and sinking faith, this brown boy carries 17 caskets and unfinished homework on his back as he drags himself through a thick cloud of purple smoke to stagger down a condemned pathway to the end of your classroom, cuffed in a black hooded sweatshirt made obituary there in the corners where he folds, crumble at each tick of that clock, knowing that in here or out there on that block he is a waste, and the living usually forgets about the dead. And that's why these teachers don't see us. If slave ship and metallic lock is the only things planned in your lessons, then what's going to free us? How do you reach us with firm grip when your hands are full with holding on to Eurocentric lectures? Treat us absent when you don't feel connected to our present. Can't call on raised hands of ghosts, so we float. Hallway glide to daunt at locker room gatherings for posts. We host school ground as purgatory. Pretend that diploma will exempt us from a white man's gun. Street sweep this poverty and teach us back our native tongues like really, though. Like really know the people you're supposed to be serving. Or is it that you do know <clears throat> And you are afraid of our awakening Either way I am that brown boy Each morning someone like me enters your classroom Outside of school hours as a prison cell In an early grave being coughed and dug to stack profit When brown bodies decay I don't need your sympathy Cause your sorries is not gonna save me Dante, you're 45 minutes late there's only 10 minutes left of class. I need you to stay after so, you, so I can talk to you. Okay, PJ, please turn to page 19 and read Romeo's monologue, starting near the top of the page. I don't have my book. <sighs> Naya, can you pass PJ your book? Thank you. Um, but soft, wet, light, throw, yonder, wit, widow, breaks. Window breaks. When window breaks. Thanks, TJ. It is the east, and Jonathan is the sun. Juliet. Ju Juliet. Arise, fair sun, and kill the, the, in, the envi in, envious moon, who is already sick and pally with grief. Pale with grief. Are you slow or something? Let somebody else read. Shut the f*** up. Leave PJ alone. Naya. Please don't curse. Remember the family agreements. I wouldn't have to curse if you would put him in his place. What the f***? Naya, I just gave you a verbal warning and now you're cursing at me. You just totally violated our family agreements for healthy communication. Yeah. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave the class. You need to go to the office right now. Really? You're gonna f kick me out when I'm the only one who did the reading and cares about your d class? Nice. <sighs> Naya leaves class, walks to front of stage, and performs her poem, Carry the One. My brother's not slow, he's angry. He's in the fourth grade, and last week the teacher told us he's being held back. He didn't quite meet their standards. He was incomplete. I remember when I taught him addition. The most basic rule of math, carry the one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. His scribbled script on elementary printed homework, tiny fingers lifted with every count. He was starting to understand, starting to carry that one, but that couldn't carry him to the next grade. My brother's not slow, he's angry. His rage mirroring his father's, the space between his thumb and forefinger forming two C's, a choke hold around a little girl's neck. This is how he learned his letters. Drawing shapes that formed a silhouette of his dad beating his mother, whoopings and slurs of how stupid and bad he is. He can't comprehend why people are mad at him. He doesn't understand their reasoning. 
All he understands is teachers paying more attention to other students. All he understands is office visits and pink referral slips. All he understands is that beating his father gives his mother. He's getting it every time he's bad at school. My brother's not slow, he's hurting. Crying for someone to hear him through the behavior you considered bad. My brother does not have ADD. He just wants to be seen. My brother is not bad. Just a kid sorry for lying on his mother and putting her in jail. My brother is not slow. He's sorry. But you are too busy judging him to understand that. You are too busy putting him into defected assembly line. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, 1865. As everyone celebrated the supposed death of slavery, is being remixed and mastered in Confederate conventions, black codes, freedmen loopholed back into slavery. But I can still see their bodies, disconfigured from the Tallahatchie. I can still hear that call, the Arizona and Skittles still lingering from my taste buds. I can hear the Bart and gun at the same time. A mother's lips and tongue, a harmony of begging in the back of her throat for her son to stay in school. This is the history lesson we don't learn in school. Instead, we learn, sit down, don't talk, raise your hand, stand in straight. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, nigger, listen to me, boy. I don't have to give you the statistics, the lessons we do learn every time you turn on your TV. From every bullet that pierces brown flesh, every cop killer with a heavy trigger finger, every hood, OG, thug, wannabe. They're only little boys, freed men at a birth molded back into slaves. Little brother, you can be a different sculpture, carry that one and it will carry you to the rest of your life, raise up over the statistics, all the people who doubt you, all the cops who look down on you. Don't let the white fear of your black tongue stop you. Little brother, I love you. Okay, DeAndre, can you please pick up where PJ left off near the middle of page 19? I don't have my book. DeAndre, this is like the fifth time you forgot your book this semester. I forgot my book too. Yeah, but this was the first time you forgot your book, PJ, which is why you're not getting the lecture. Cool. DeAndre, what's going on with you? Remember our agreements to hold each other accountable? Hello? I really... Did you just answer the phone while I'm talking to you? Yeah. I know, but I can't talk DeAndre, right now. DeAndre, I need you to step up to and take responsibility for your education. I'll talk to you later. Responsibility? How's she gonna tell me about responsibility? She don't know what I go through with my mama? Mama, as I recall, not all. But some fights were my fault. But you don't care enough to find a solution. And if we're not fighting, I have to push you to do things for me. I act like it don't hurt, but it is hurting to see you coming in the meetings every week. And I can't manage to deal with that. So I take advantage of my own mama. I even blame her on why I'm messing up, even after I notice her having symptoms from multiple sclerosis like numbness in her body so she can't really walk. Cause I'm messing up in school, people wanna talk in my ear about grades. Life is really hitting me. It's hard to handle this responsibility. I was being 11, 12, 13 at the time when I found out my mom had a disease weakening her mind. Taking that in and being a kid, nobody told or showed me how I should deal with it. And I complain and say life's not fair. Why am I taking care of my own mama? Managing bills, making sure she's clean and making sure she ate. But my teachers never knew what I was dealing with at home because they never asked. Unless I had homework, they didn't talk to me. I would just be shut out. The finger was always pointed at me, but they didn't realize I had to be the one to make sure food was put in the fridge. Bills were paid. They didn't realize that my mom never checked in to see if my work was done or help me with my time management. So homework was the least of my worries. Bell rings, the rest of the class gets up to leave and Dante stays sitting. Guys, don't forget the test tomorrow. That test. Oh, my God. Dante, can you please come up here so I can talk to you? I can hear you from here. Okay, I'll come to you then. So what's up? Why have you been missing class and coming in halfway through? I see the potential in you, but if you fail the test tomorrow, there's a good chance that you're going to fail my class. It won't be the first time. OK. So what's going on? Ain't nothing. I'm good. You don't seem good. You don't seem like you care anymore. What's there to care about? 
Um, well, college, that's the way you're going to succeed. College? Where I'm from, we don't make it to college. But we're trying to change that by getting you on a college track. Right now, I ain't really worried about school. You feel me? I got a lot of stuff to take care of at the house, and I got to do what I got to do. Dante, you're never going to get yourself out of this position if you don't take responsibility and accountability for your own life. You're making choices that are setting yourself up for failure. <laughs> choices? Yeah. I'm making choices. Yeah. So I chose to be raised in the projects. I chose for my pops to go to jail. I chose for my mom to have all of these kids and not taking care of her responsibility. I chose to have all of these brothers and sisters. I chose not to have no job or not all of that stuff. I got to do what I got to do, you feel me? Where I come from, jobs is not getting uh, offered to people like me. And, and, and people next door is getting killed, you feel me? So I got to do what I got to do. I'm not worried about no tests right now. I'm not worried about no grades and no school or none of that. I'm trying to make it to the next day. College is four or five years down the road, you feel me? I'm trying to get home tonight. So I ain't really tripping about no test. It sounds like you are going through a lot, and I'm really sorry to hear that. So how about this? How about I extend the test for you until next Friday? So you have an extra week to study. <laughs> you ain't hearing nothing I just said, huh? No, I, I did. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> All right, lady. Thanks. So, thanks. Thanks for your consideration. Thanks. So, thanks. I really appreciate that. Next Friday? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hopefully I'll make it past tomorrow. Okay, this is where we would show the film clip. Um, and then we can get right into the pedagogy part. Students are sitting in a circle, laughing, joking, and dancing. And we're about to start a raw talent workshop. Raw! Talent. Talent. Raw. Talent. Hey, what's up? Thank y'all for coming. Hey. Uh, it's been a so, long semester, and uh, we've been talking about a lot of different topics, but today we just wanted to wrap it up with just a few uh, questions and, you know, just an open dialogue. Uh, so I just got a few things I wanted to ask y'all first. One being, why do y'all feel like spaces like these are important for young people to come to? I feel like spaces like these are important for people like me. People like you? What you mean by that? I mean, a space where a black young man can uh, express himself to other black young people and they can actually relate to what I'm talking about. Mm. It feels like people are listening to us as youth. It's the only space where we feel comfortable. So. I mean, I don't have a big family, so when I come into spaces like this, it, it makes me feel like I have more people who understand me, and they, it makes me feel like I have a second family. Mm. I feel that. Okay, so I hear a lot of people feel like they need a space where they can come and express themselves, relate to other people, and with relating to other people, that builds that family bond. So outside of this space, do you feel like your voice is heard by your teachers or adults? Why or why not? I feel like my voice is heard because I put it in a way that's respectful and they're able to understand what I'm saying. Okay. My teachers think that they know everything. And it makes me feel like like I'm stupid or I can't ask questions, you know? Yes, I feel like teachers listen to me because I put myself out there. But sometimes when I challenge them, it gets misinterpreted as disrespectful. I love when teachers encourage us to challenge them. For sure. For sure. I respect that. I feel like at school, teachers don't really hear what I got to say because they feel like they're uh, smarter than me because of degrees and such, such things like that. But on the streets, I feel like adults understand me more because we come from the same place. Hmm. So, if you could tell your teachers anything, what would y'all tell them? Take the time to listen to your students. <clears throat> make make your class relatable to your students' lives. Like, like in math class. If, if you would have, like, like if the teacher would taught us how to manage our money so that I could apply that, what I learned to my daily life. Well, I'm a kinesthetic learner, so I learn better in groups. So I have to do stuff in order to be able to understand it. Hmm. So I tell my teacher to, like, be more creative and engage all kinds of learners. Okay. Yeah, it's important for the teachers to take in consideration on who they're teaching and how there's different types of learners. Like some people are visual learners, hmm. some people are audio learners, and some people are, uh, yeah, different types of learners. 
So taking the time to get to know the people that you're working with, taking the time to um, find out different ways to relate the same message to those who learn differently and introducing other people who learn one way to, uh, to take another approach on how to get information. Okay, that's cool. I respect that. Okay, so what I want y'all to do is use this writing prompt. You can write it down or come, it up, come up with it in your mind, but just take this in consideration. Just come up and fill, it, fill in the blanks. Uh, I want everybody to write one sentence off of this uh, writing prompt. Instead of blank, I wish you would have blank. So whatever it is that you wish your teacher would have done instead of what they did. So it could be instead of kicking me out of class because I was late, I wish you would have asked me why I was late and then you would have heard my story and then we could have worked something out. You know what I mean? Something like that. So just take like a couple seconds to, to write that in. Anybody ready? I'll go. Instead of pressuring me and embarrassing me, when I take a while reading or doing my math problem, I wish you would have be patient with me and understand my learning disability. Instead of focusing on the money and the hours, I wish you would focus on the students. Mm. Instead of teaching me what you learned, I wish you would challenge those teachings and think of better ways to reach us and get us to care about your lessons. Instead of kicking me out of class, I wish you would listen to what I had to say. You might just learn something. Okay, so then we go into our own little separate speeches. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do anything? Let me ask you a couple of questions about okay. that. That was beautiful. How do you develop a piece like that? Is this your own experience? Is it sort of the collective experience of more people in the room? Are you saying your own voices? Like, how do you develop this kind of piece? I think uh, when we was talking about what we was going to do, um, how to present this, uh, we just start improving, which means like on the spot, just coming up with scenarios like you play the teacher, you play. I, I feel like everybody pretty much played themselves. Like Naya, she really has a little brother who who she feel that way about. Like he's not slow. He got a lot going on. Um, me, I was that person that a lot of teachers felt like you have a lot of potential. Why don't you care? And I'm like, my cousin just got shot yesterday. They they we fighting at school. It's a lot of other stuff going on. I'm not worried about no test tomorrow. And DeAndre really has to, you know, take care of his household. So it's like we draw from our own personal experiences, and then we just put that in a scenario. We just improv, like, you know, off of that. And it was pretty much like whatever we came up with, we just wrote it down. And most of our writing and what we do is inspired off of us first. And then we try to keep in mind of everybody else who, we, who can relate to our story and then put, you know, this and that up in there to give it the richness of the topic. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. One of the reasons that I wanted to have you here today was, in addition to you, it was just so powerful, the work that you did, is that you really challenged a lot of the dominant stories about what education is and what it should be, right? Like the idea that all the knowledge sits in the teacher, they're going to just put it into unknowing passive students, that education has to happen just in the classroom. It doesn't happen in community or among friends or outside of the classroom, that adults know best about what's wrong with the educational system and the way to fix it is more testing. That's how you really show what people know. Like all these kinds of messages about the educational system, you all really challenge that in a very deep and emotional and profound way. Is there anything else that you would want to say to educators and to people about some of those messages? I was just going to say the character I was playing was mm -hmm. supposed to be, I didn't want to be totally stereotypical, but I was representing a lot of the, I used to do outreach when I was the outreach coordinator at Making Wave, so I would um, go out and sit in on the classes at all of the different schools in the Bay Area that our students went to, mm -hmm. and I would observe both the student and the teacher to try to figure out what can we do to support these students in our program, and what are the gaps we need to be filling in based on if it was a really strong class or whether the class felt like they weren't learning much. And the thing that I kept seeing was a lot of young, well-intentioned, um, white teachers who are not from the community, a lot of them through programs like Teach for America, which it's a great program, but what we see happen a lot with the power dynamic in those classes or just the general like culture clash is that the teacher comes in without a ton of training, they don't know the community, they don't know the kids, and they're trying their best 
to follow the curriculum and do what they're supposed to do and follow the community agreements and make it a safe space, but they're not actually like taking the time to listen to what the students are saying to them. So there was so much happening in that back and forth where I wasn't trying to be rude, but if I would just stop and really think about what Naya said to me, like she's the only one that comes to class and because she said one cuss word, I kicked her out of class instead of realizing that she was standing up for PJ and that she was doing the thing I as a teacher should have stepped in and done. And I think I, a lot of times I see teachers almost kind of having fear around classroom management and not really knowing how to address their students without it feeling really tense and so they kind of just let things slide. And there's this author, Lisa Delpit, who I really love, who has a lot of amazing books, The Skin That We Speak, Teaching Other People's Children. I think that's what it's called. And she has one um, article. She has a chapter in The Skin That We Speak about the permission of fail versus the demand for success. And she speaks about how a lot of well-intentioned white teachers, or they don't even have to be white, but like middle-class teachers or teachers who are not from the communities of color that they're teaching in, will they think that they're helping the students out by letting them by extending the test deadline or by letting them not participate that day. Um, They think that they're being nice and supportive, but really what they're doing is sending a subliminal message to the students that they don't have high expectations for them and that they think that they can't actually reach those expectations. So, oh, you're having a hard time in life? Well, then I'm just going to let you not do your work. But really then that allows the student to slip further and further away from where they need to be at. So I was trying to represent not like a horrible racist intense like teacher but more so one that actually is trying to do the right thing but hasn't done enough education around for themselves around their students around their students lived realities and around alternative teaching methods and ways that they can engage um, their students and so I was trying to represent that kind of a character and challenging those specific types of teachers to not just do what you learned in college or what your the admin is telling you to do but to really take the time to get to know your kids get to know the community and do your own research to figure out alternative ways to engage them mm-hmm. yeah very well said all right thank you all so basically in raw talent we have a culture where we have a workshop we have a discussion and then we have a writing prompt on a discussion. And then before each poet or writer share what they speak, we say speak life. And we got that from um, oral tradition out in Haiti where it's called crit crack, where the speaker says crit, which means do you want to hear a story? And then the audience says crack means yes, tell us the story. But we say speak life. And the speaker says speak, and then the audience says life, which means that if you are ready to hear something that is going to be uplifting or positive or giving birth to something new uh, from all of the things that we experience in our lives. So, uh, speak. Life. Life. Speak. Life. These days I feel solid as Sequoia. Count my rings and tell me who I am. You will see why my footing is so certain, why I'm thick with memory. I come from three generations of plumbers and four generations of storytellers, so I know how to bend words and weld worlds. My roots run deep across the ocean to a tiny shtetl in Kiev. My family's stories pass down like gold to be saved because my people know what it means to be erased. Our family escaped the Holocaust, displaced in America. We know that if you take a person's history, you take away their future. They say Yiddish is a dying language. What does a dying language look like? You want to kill a people? Cut their tongues first. Watch how thick the blood flows over the teeth, how quick the color fades from the flesh. Watch, too, how the ones who survive learn to use their other limbs, to walk to the market for onions, to cook the brisket until it's tender, to keep living. Earlier this month, I watched my grandfather die, watched my mother tongue flounder in his mouth. He was the last one. My grandparents wanted us to blend in, to lose the accent, to gain access to lives they could never have. So here I am, the immigrant's dream, the assimilated Jew. My native tongue is standard English. My white skin gives me privilege. It's survival of the fittest. Gotta get in where you fit in, so I get why they did it. Still, I hear my ancestors whisper, Bubula, never forget. So I've been trying to salvage the culture I come from, but when your language is lost, how do you find yourself? How does a flower grow without roots? I started Raw Talent for two reasons. First, because my mama is a storyteller who raised me in the rich oral tradition of cultural folklore. Second, because when I was 15, spoken word poetry completely changed my life. It all started when I met my sophomore English teacher, Jeff Cass. Jeff was nearly fired every other day for his alternative teaching methods. 
He would have us run up and down the hall yelling quotes from classic literature. Romeo, oh Romeo, wherefore art thou, thou Romeo? Romeo? Okay, let's just back that one up real quick. I forgot what the word was. <laughs> he would have us run up and down the hall yelling quotes from classic literature. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Romeo? He showed us contemporary poetry that spoke to our lives. He challenged us to open up, to get personal, and take risks with our writing. Jeff invited me to come to his spoken word workshops after school and pushed me to compete in the local poetry slam. So I started writing, performing, traveling, and teaching workshops at a young age. I transformed from a shy, passive girl into a confident, outspoken young leader in my community. But while I was thriving, several of my friends, all young black men, dropped out of high school. I remember seeing their essays peppered with red marks, telling them their language was wrong. No one ever taught them the different grammar rules between standard English and what some refer to as black English or Ebonics. Their teacher simply called it a mistake, reinforcing the message that their language and therefore they were inferior. For youth of color who grew up in homes where standard English is not their mother tongue, language can become a prison at school. Their bodies are policed in the street and their words are policed on the page. But if their cultures and home languages are celebrated, they're often able to open up engage in the learning process, and acquire the code-switching skills needed to succeed. Making space for creative expression in our curriculum is one way to recenter our students in the classroom. Standard grammar rules are thrown out the window. Students have the poetic license to play with language, to explore their emotions and identities. Of course, this is all easier said than done. I was an English teacher for three years, so I remember how hard it was to make space for creativity with the pressure of grades, testing, and standards looming over my head. I felt like my success as a teacher was measured by how many of my students got A's. But whenever I felt discouraged, I remembered Jeff, how he stayed up late at night creating curriculum to fit his particular students' needs, how he risked his job every day to make his classroom a space we wanted to come. Being a teacher for social justice is challenging, but it's so critical. One teacher can change hundreds of lives. I'm so grateful for all the educators out there working to create empowering spaces for our students. And just remember, if we want our students to take risks in their writing, we have to take risks with our teaching. Speak life. life. Speak life. I try to talk to myself. I trace the outline and shade in the person in that mirror. I understand the crooked mindset that festers in my brain. I wonder if my bruised childhood crept out of spaces between my teeth, would you care? For 18 years to be exact, I didn't know who I was. I knew my name, but didn't quite understand my purpose on this earth. I mean, what 13 year old would? I grew up in Richmond, California. <clears throat> I never met my dad. I never really had family out here. It was my granny, mom, little brother, and I by ourselves in a two bedroom apartment in South Richmond. In these days of childhood, I would write little, silly little songs at recess in elementary school. One of them was, my name is Naya, her name is Naya, and then so on. And then so on with each friend. It was so funny, we thought we were really doing something. When writing these silly songs, I didn't really think of myself as a writer or anything. One day, Molly Rayner came up to me recruiting for raw talent. When I first started writing and performing, I was timid, if you could imagine that. Hiding behind my paper when I read, Dante Clark was a co-facilitator, and he thought I should do a slam, one of the biggest poetry competitions in the Bay Area for youth. I was hesitant at first, but eventually I caved and went in and went for it. For my first time at the age of 13, I made it to finals, which was a pretty big deal, but I didn't think so at the time. Slamming for the next two years, my writing improved, and I became more confident. I ended up winning the slam back to back. I got to travel for the first time doing something I loved. It was a great experience. Raw Talent gave me the platform to take these opportunities. I didn't even know I was this talented and would not have known if Molly hadn't reached out to me that one day. I look back and think about how far I've come with my writing, my attitude, my life, my craft, my passion. It's just a blessing to have Raw Talent there. We are family. But you've never met a family like this before. We don't play that. We love hard. People feel comfortable enough to say what's on their minds and say what they have going on, leading them to being able to tap in, hit that dark place, and go deeper in their poetry. 
In Raw Talent, we have very strong people who are always hurting and messed up in the head from awful childhoods and traumatizing experiences. I know I can really testify on that subject. I used to numb myself to my pain and pretend I didn't care about the abuse I had witnessed as a child. Raw Talent being this family-based program helped me find myself in my emotions, which is not easy. I love Raw Talent, and if I did not have them, I would probably be a statistic influenced by the wrong people. I was blessed to have the right ones in my life. I never had a class in school where I was able to be my full self and express my experiences. I got the message to leave my drama at the door and never given the opportunity to say how I really felt. I was angry because no teacher ever asked how I was doing outside of school, so I felt misunderstood. It would have been so powerful if our teachers had just asked how we were doing, starting class with a check-in instead of diving right into the lesson. My biggest challenge to you all is to create opportunities for your students to share their lives and feelings and make, make it feel safe enough for them to be honest and open. If students leave our drama at the door, you're actually asking us to leave lives at the door. But if you find a way to weave our culture and struggles and passion into your curriculum, we can be our full selves in your classroom. Speak life. life. Speak life. Speak life. Now in Raw Town, it's a pipeline for the most for the most committed students after they graduate. They get the chance to come on as staff and become strong teachers. We have a program called Teachers in Training. That's the program I was just talking about. Now Dante Clark. He was the first one in the program. You know, he was my teacher. He wasn't the teachers I was used to, though. He was someone I could relate to. He always asked the right questions. He made me feel like I was a human being. I was able to talk to him and didn't have to worry about him judging me. He was somebody I was comfortable with listening to as well. Because he was saying a lot of things with meaning. And when he talked to me, it wasn't a lecture. It was more of a conversation. A few months after I graduated, I was asked to come back and volunteer. And as I was volunteering, I started shadowing Molly and Dante. And I felt like, ooh, I could do what they did. Yeah, teaching workshops. You know, it didn't look that difficult when I saw them do it. But uh, when I decided to teach workshops, it, it didn't go the way I thought it was finna go. You know, I was... uh. Nervous, stiff, well, I'm always stiff, but I was nervous, <laughs> stiff, and I had cotton mouth at the time, and, and it, just, it just really threw me off. But after a while, I kept doing it, and I got more comfortable, and I became more experienced, and it became much more natural. I began to recognize how important it is to be a youth and teach other youth. You see, as youth, we have to get opportunities, and it will help us recognize that we have something to bring in the world. And that's the step closer to realizing the, the self-value and purpose we have. And us as teachers, we're supposed to help them help themselves. And we have to care and understand. Uh. Speak life. life. Speak life. life. It's a lot of things that was said in this, in this presentation, so I'm, I'm gonna try not to repeat everything too much but uh my experience is I've, I've grown closer to to the teachers or uh, facilitators who allow me into their lives you feel me who shared a piece of themselves and not just kept it to the information that's in the book but but allow me to be myself and bring my whole self into the classroom and one of the things that i would share with the listeners out there is if you don't teach people who they really are then everything that you're doing is teaching them to assimilate into a culture in a system that that uh, devours their existence, like completely, language and everything about us, um, that's not that's not making no changes. A lot of people I dealt with was teaching me to do the homework and get good grades, but the lessons that I'm learning is full of lies. And you teaching me to regurgitate information in order to pass, but I'm not really learning nothing. And then by the time I get into college and I start taking classes I want to take, then I start realizing, damn, the last 22 years of my life has been a lie. So now I have to start all over, and that's a whole other process. And by then, the battle could be then lost. So many people lies and been uh, misled or taken. And uh, I say, understand who you're working with, uh, not just 
that individual, but where they coming from and, and build in your curriculum uh, things that will give them the skills to challenge themselves and strengthening those tools that they don't know that they have, bringing that stuff out, making sure it's a lot of community work. Uh, you got to get to know the parents because with Raw Talent, what we do is we, we, we try to get to know everybody that's in your family, um, your friends, your parents, your cousins, et cetera. We try to get to know who you are and where you're coming from, and that help us um, better understand who we're dealing with and not just in the classroom in that hour but outside of the classroom. And, uh, yeah, bro, it takes a lot of love and compassion. You got to love who, who you're dealing with, and if you love them, then there's certain things that you will go to the, uh, you'll go to lengths of doing. It won't just be stuck in, um, you know what I mean, a confined space. Love don't have no boundaries, right? So you got to love the people who you're working with, and uh, you got to think outside the box, you feel me? I had closing statements I made the day of that I think mm, I would be I. worth to say, like, two of those things <laughs> okay. here. Um, uh, are you going to be putting, like, any audio from the clip that we showed? into this interview, no. do you think? No, okay. No, I'm, I'm really gonna do everything right off of what we have here. Is it okay if we plug a couple of things? Or do Absolutely, you think that I was actually time? gonna ask you what was up next for Raw Talent, how people can get involved. So I will ask you those questions, okay. but anything you wanna say, go for it. Well, I think that's pretty much it. What I know one thing that is a challenge for a lot of teachers is that they have to follow certain standards. They have to, in public schools at least, there's the common core for English teachers and language arts. Um, so the teacher I was talking about, Jeff Cass, who's an English teacher at Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, who started a spoken word movement in Ann Arbor, he actually published a book called Uncommon Core, which you can find on Amazon, I think, or you can Google it, or you can contact me about it. And he basically takes each like core standard that you need to hit in your curriculum and pairs it with a bunch of contemporary social justice based poetry written by mm -hmm. um, mostly young people and people of color around the country. So then instead of just trying to use like old irrelevant poetry, um, not that the canon is irrelevant, it's also important, but it is a tool, a really good teaching tool for English teachers that I'd recommend you guys getting. It's called Uncommon Core by Jeff Cass. Um, do you want me to go into the stuff that's coming up? Yeah, so le so let me let me ask you my couple of questions, and then if there's anything I didn't hit. So um, <laughs> tell us what's next for Raw Talent. What are you working on now, and what's coming up in the future? Um, we have a couple things coming up with Raw Talent, and then I'll let Micah talk about what's coming up with Rise in general. Um, so specifically with Raw Talent, we're working on a play that's going to be produced in either May or June. And it's different than anything we've done before. Um, for the first time, Dante is not writing it. Uh, Naya is writing it. She So at age 18, she's writing her first play, which we're very excited about. Um, and it's about a young, a 14-year-old female MC trying to make it in the hip-hop scene in Richmond and the Bay Area and trying to break stereotypes about women in hip-hop and coming up against a lot of sexism, a lot of racism, a lot of homophobia and transphobia. It's really the first time that we've ever delved into exploring gender and sexuality in one of our shows. Um, we usually focus more on violence against young men of color and turf wars in Richmond, so we're really excited to be trying to bring, centralize the stories of young women of color um, and queer youth. So that's a play we're working on now and we'll give you more information once we know the exact date and location. There's also a film that's going to be released in the spring. There's a documentary being made by Jason Zeldis and Jay-Z Productions yeah. about Dante um, and about Raw Talent and Rise and Richmond. And basically the, the documentary follows Dante and our program in the year leading up to the first play that we put on, Taste Harmony. Do you want to just explain it a little bit? Yeah. So Tay's Harmony is a Richmond interpretation of Romeo and Juliet, and uh, we felt like we wanted to address gun violence in our community because a lot of the students come from the community. Like I come from North Richmond, and most of my students is from Central or South Richmond. So our neighborhoods are literally at odds with each other, and it's been going on for decades and decades, and a lot of people have their own theory on why we're at odds with each other, but don't nobody really have any solutions so we wanted to take Romeo and Juliet because it's a classic tale that the world knows but we wanted to bring the world into what we go through and so we found a perfect way to take that and put Tay's Harmony and tell the stories of North and Central Richmond and uh, Tay and Harmony and then giving it 
a theory of what if the parents was best friends doing illegal stuff in the streets back in the day, a deal went wrong, and then that's why they're at odds, but the young people are carrying on this beef that they don't really know nothing about. And so now it's up to us to take our lives back and be like, okay, this is what happened in the past. We, know, we are no longer are going to continue this conflict that started with our forefathers, but we can change it because we are now the ones that's carrying it on. So that was pretty much the basics of Tay's Harmony to to give some 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 type of beginning. Like, what if it happened over something as simple as a misunderstanding, but so many people had to pay for it, go to jail, uh, lost their lives, paralyzed, wounded, or just traumatized by these experiences. So we wanted to talk about that. And at the end, um, well, I'll just tell it. At the end, you know, Romeo and Juliet, they, they take their own lives for the love of each other. But we decided that because there's so many people that die in Richmond, we're not going to take no more lives and Tay and Harmony stand up against their parents and tell them, like, this was your life, but this is the life that we want for our future and our future future. You know what I mean? So then that's how we ended it, and that's what gave it the dynamic shift from Romeo and Juliet, and it's called Tay's Harmony. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the script of Tay's Harmony is published as a book, and we also have a DVD of the live production, so if there's any educators or youth workers out there that want to use it as a teaching tool, um, they can just directly get in contact with us to get copies. Okay, and so let's talk about how people get in contact, and also who is Rise and Raw Talent open to? Like, do you have to be a Richmond resident? Do you have to be of a certain age? Um, well, anyone who's interested in getting involved in Raw Talent or RISE programming, um, we're located in Richmond, California on 41st Street, um, right next to the new Target on McDonald, I think is the closest cross street. Um, and it's open to young folks ages 13 to 21. You don't have to be a Richmond resident. Um, all of the programs and services that we offer are free of charge as long as you are between the ages of 13 and 21. Um, <laughs> and you can contact us either on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's all at Rise Youth Center. Um, and then our information as well as on Google. You can just give us a call and get some information. Come by, get a tour, um, stop by at our coming up event. Um, we're having a community-based event on the 13th of December for all ages in the community for folks to come down and enjoy just a good time in the winter um, season and be able to get some toys distributed to young folks and some hoodies distributed to our member age folks. Just have a good time in the community, get some food, watch some of the lovely raw talent folks perform on stage, um, and have a good time. Yeah. All right. What is it that most concerns you about the future of education? And what is it that most gives you hope? Once again, what uh, most concerns me about education is that young people don't know who they are. That's just period. Um, I had read a quote before that says, if you teach them that their history started as slaves, everything after that will be an accomplishment. So the fact that people will then equate success with money or having a nice house or getting a piece of paper from a, a, a school that says you're validated but now we already knows that in this society you can have a diploma, you still get treated any kind of way. Uh, still can get killed by the police, still can go to jail, not guaranteed to get any paying job. And then so it's kind of like, what are we really here for? So school is kind of like, a, it kind of goes hand in hand with sports and entertainment and all of that other stuff. But like knowing who you are, how to till to the earth how to not buy products and how to do stuff yourself, how to build, what happened to wood shop and workshop on building things. And like, instead of trying to buy in these houses, why not build our own? Like, it's things like that that we actually need. Instead of buying clothes, what happened to, you know, us making our own? Like, tools that we can actually use for ourselves, but we already know that in most cases, education is not going to change like that. And that's what would scare me about that. Um, what I can hope for is that it's people who will be self-taught and knowing that education is not between 8 and 3 o'clock at this building, but anything that, any time that you can learn something and get information and uh, valid information and cross-reference what you're learning, not just reading one book, but reading several books on that topic and try to figure out what's really going on in the world. And I feel like that is what I hope for, for educators to be to be living that example and not just reading a book, but actually applying it to your lives and showing people how to go out there and get the information. Beautiful. Nicely said. Anybody else? Uh, like bro just said about uh, the misconception of education, a lot of people 
don't understand what it is. People think that education is school, and if you ain't in school, you ain't in education. And if a lot of people don't want to be in school because of the fact of the hours or they have something else on their mind, and because of teachers are not reaching them, they feel teachers not reaching the students the way the students felt they should be re reached, then they don't care about education. But the thing about it is education is just learning, gaining knowledge that will help you and support you. And the one thing that I do have hope for is raw talent because we're letting people know that it's not just school because we educate people every day, but we don't do it the exact way a lot of school teachers or how the school line does it. Raw talent is its own thing, and we do it in a very important way, and we make sure that we're significant. Nice. Nicely said. Hey, can you ask the question again? What is it that most concerns you about the future of education, and what is it that gives you the most hope? Hmm. What most concerns me is uh, how we're going to get this, this next generation to, uh, to uh, try to educate themselves on uh, certain subjects, like uh, where they come from. Because uh, if you talk to them, a lot of them don't even... Some of them don't even care about where they came from. They think they came from uh, from America, but they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to trace back their history. But um, what I have, what I um, what was the second question? What, gi what gives you <laughs> what gives you the most hope about the future? Uh, what gives me the most hope about the future is us, the work that we do. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Um, my biggest concern about education is just how there's more and more pressure on testing. Um, my sister's a pre-K teacher at a charter school and her three-year-old and four-year-old students have to go through two weeks of testing like every couple months. Um, standardized testing for toddlers basically and if they don't pass then they can't move on and that's that's how m intelligence has been measured for a long time but it seems like we're moving closer and closer, or we're, we're putting more and more pressure on standardized testing, which is already a very flawed, problematic, racist form of measuring intelligence. Um, but in addition to that, it's not teaching students how to be critical thinkers. And to me, like, the number one most important thing that we can teach is critical thinking and questioning um, and getting students to come up with their own opinions and not just learn how to memorize facts and regurgitate them on tests and forget them the next day. So my, my concern is the larger school to prison pipeline and the ways that um you know kids are tracked differently but but more specifically i guess the emphasis we put on standardized testing test scores grades and not actually meeting each student where they're at um what gives me hope is programs like rise and raw and um a lot of amazing programs I've seen around the country that take a holistic approach to young people that think that education is not just what happens in the classroom, but also um, making sure that there's mental health counseling available, making sure that we use the arts and creativity to approach young people, um, sports, you know, just approaching youth with a lot of different outlets for them to express themselves and not just telling them you have to come into this class and memorize stuff, walk out, and we'll never see you again. So I think RISE um, does a really good job meeting each young person where they're at and trying to develop plans that support their particular needs, and that makes me excited to see. All right. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I think the one thing that I'm, I'm cautious or nervous about in our current educational system is the intense thriving of the school to prison pipeline, the fact that it's something that we constantly have to be aware of and constantly um, concerned about our young folks falling into. I think the zero tolerance policy that's in place in a lot of our um, school districts in the state of California plays a huge role in marginalizing um, young people of color and allowing them to fall into those pitfalls that we have in our educational system and the leaks that we have in our educational system that allow them to talk out of turn and then you're missing school for a week. And so I think the the willful defiance clause in our zero defiance or our zero tolerance um, policies allow young folks to fall back into these 
these systems where they are not cared about or they are looked over or um, are absent in a sense where once they're absent, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and their their well-being and their success are no longer um, at the forefront of our educators' minds. Um, and I think it's important to continue to remind young folks um, to to seek out their own education. And that's one hope that I have for the future is that programs like RISE and programs like Raw Talent and teachers like Jeff Koss will continue to move forward and continue to develop curriculum that will impact the world. And young folks won't wait until they're in high school um, or until they're out of high school and into college to really just find their own definition of education and really look forward to different realms of education and different um, experiences on how to educate themselves. I waited until I went to a four-year university to really understand what self-educating myself meant. Um, and I just hope that young folks don't follow the same paths that many of us have already fell into because of the system that we grew up in. Mm, really well said. Thank you. Our guests today have been members of the performing group Raw Talent, part of the Rye Center in Richmond, California. I want to thank Dante Clark, DeAndre Evans, TJ Sykes, Molly Rayner, and Micah Marshall. You all are absolutely awesome, wise, and inspiring. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>